book, Hardwiring Excellence, Quinn Studer talks of the passion and self-motivation of people who work in healthcare. He asks, who but a self-motivated person could hold a dying infant in her arms and still come to work every day for more of the same? Summer and Jay Ortiz personally experienced that passion at Waccamaw Hospital, where Summer delivered a son who died soon after birth. Linda Bresnicki, a labor and delivery nurse with a background in psych nursing, was on duty that day. Linda has a very special ability to work with grieving families, and since her experience with the Ortiz family, she has created a detailed bereavement program to help parents and caregivers cope with the loss of a baby. I was about 32 weeks pregnant um, with our second child. We found out, I uh, went to MUSC and found out that he had um, polycystic uh, kidneys basically. They were just full of cyst. They told us that he wasn't going to live um, and I don't think we could really fathom it at the time. We, we left and uh, we're just trying to sink it all in, um, just felt like there was no way this was possible. There had to be something that they could do. Um, and I think the stress of it kind of put me into labor. So I spent a lot of time with Summer. She ended up having to have a C-section. We talked about the plan of care for the baby. And she basically didn't want any extraordinary measures and just wanted to be able to spend time with him. Whenever they pulled him out, he it was almost like a kitten's purr. There was just not much of a cry, and, and that's because his lungs were not developed. I went into the delivery room with her, and JJ was born. He lived probably, I'm not exactly sure how long, an hour or so after birth. I arranged that her parents and grandparents, or her grandparents and um, JJ's older sister could come in and took lots of pictures, which they have today. Um, she said, I tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna wrap him up and, and hand him to you in summer and let you guys enjoy him for the rest of the time that he's here. And Linda had her camera with her and she asked if she could take pictures and we said, yeah, I mean, that's all we have of him is those pictures and a few little things and that uh, meant so much to us because we have that to help us heal. I think it was mainly after Summer and Jay came in and JJ was delivered that I realized how important it is for parents to have and families and grandparents now that I'm a grandma to have support and people to talk to and the pictures and we have groups that make beautiful little gowns and little hats and we get all kinds of pictures and Years later, people look back at them, and it's a treasure for them. And I don't think they realize that when they come in. Non-smoker John Sanders was shocked to learn four years ago that he has stage four lung cancer. But the disease hasn't slowed down the administrator of MUSC's Children's Hospital in Charleston. Two weeks after a chemo treatment, he rode 66 miles in the Jerry Zucker Ride for Hope to raise more than $1,600 for cancer research. John also uses his personal experience following major surgery to help caregivers better understand the emotional needs of patients and families. But I woke up the second night and it was extremely difficult. And my first thought was, well, why can't I pass out? Because I couldn't breathe, the pain was fairly intense. Um, and the nurses were great, they, they came in and settled me down. But during the same event, the second thought was one that's really kind of embarrassing but I do tell my staff, and it was, I can't do this. I mean, I was ready for it to be over. That is embarrassing, and the next morning I was sitting in, in my uh, room, because they, they, they get you up early, and uh, surgeons like to come in really early to round. So I was sitting kind of in the dark, and I was, I was kind of angry about the thought that I'd had. And then I suddenly thought, I wonder how many people in this hospital over at the Institute of Psychiatry and even in the Children's Hospital had the same thought I did that night. And my guess is that there are a lot of people. And I hope to uh, patients uh, that have different forms of cancer can maybe see 
what I've been able to do and understand that they can keep living uh, in normal lives and keep pushing themselves. Um, I, I don't think that I do anything extra. Um, I'm just living life. Thanks to some very special mentors in his life, Raymond Bino had a dream to become a surgeon. Today, he is paying it forward by helping and encouraging children to work toward their dreams. Since 1987, Dr. Bino has taken realistic evidence about Dying Young, or his READY program, to thousands of kids. We decided to come up with the program Project READY, and it's real, realistic evidence about Dying Young. And that's how we came up with the name. And the name talks specific, specifically about making appropriate choices when you're out, but it also is, we expanded the program to say, let's think about things that you can do in the hospital. Sometimes folks have never seen uh, particularly so African-American physicians and particularly so surgeons. And so it was an opportunity for exposure. Uh, and, and growing up in, when I was growing up, there were teachers that were there that made a difference in my life that they took us places to see different things and through that uh, was what led me to think I can do this because the community needs that. They need to have me out there in the community talking to kids in elementary school, middle school, high school, letting them know that there are things available that they can do and never let anybody take your dream away. Our next story is about another surgeon who has practiced in Pickens, South Carolina for nearly four decades. Dr. James Mahanes even served a term as coroner. His experience makes him acutely aware of community problems. His upbringing makes him ready to attack those problems head on. That's how he came to lead the Prescription Narcotics Task Force of Pickens County. There was an awful lot of prescription narcotics uh, being prescribed. And quite frankly, I, I went to the staff and I said, this is ridiculous. This is just absolutely ridiculous. We, we've got to do something about this. So you know the way it is, you, you make the noise, you get the job. We, we wanted to get the physicians to recognize that they were making it too easy. But we felt like we had to give them resources uh, that they, they could use to go and get help uh, uh, that, that they needed. But we had a recovering addict come to one of our meetings and um, she discussed her problem and, and whatnot, but she was a local person and she revealed to the group there, she says, look, the word's getting out. You don't come down to Cannon to get narcotics. Neither snow nor rain nor heat nor gloom of night keeps this courier from the swift completion of her appointed round. No, Julia Evans is not a mail carrier, but after 43 years on the job at Carolina's hospital system in Florence, she has never missed a day she was scheduled to work and has never been late to work. Even a snowstorm in January 2011 could not keep Julia away from the patients who count on her. Um, I was off that day. Ms. Rona called me that afternoon, said, Julia, do you want to come and stay at the hospital? I told her, no. She said, you gonna be here? I said, yes, I will be there. So, we hang up that next morning. I got ready. I got my coat, my hat, my stuff, and we come on to work. The car couldn't move, because it was, the snow had it pinned down. So I said, oh well, I start walking. And I started walking. Well, I called up here about 6.15. Um, Julia's shift doesn't start until 6.30. But Julia already answered the phone, and I said, Julia, I'm just checking to make sure you made it in. And she said, oh, yes, Miss Rona, I walked. And I said, well, thank goodness that you're there. And, um, you know, that was really extraordinary. And it wasn't until I came into work a little bit later that I heard the whole story, that she had anticipated driving to work, and her car wasn't able to maneuver in the weather. And so she did actually head out to work um, in her boots and heavy snow jacket and um, got here in plenty of time to make sure the patients got their breakfast. Laura Perdue and Jennifer Schlett manage day-to-day -day operations of the Emergency Department Intensive Care Unit at Somerville Medical Center. 
When they noticed people coming to the emergency room in search of food, they decided to do something about it. Laura and Jennifer started the HEN Project, which stands for Hunger Ends Now. The project teaches members of the community sustainable gardening techniques. They donate the food they grow to local food banks and churches. We actually have a nonprofit project going on in our hometown of Monk's Corner. It's called the HEN Project. It stands for Hunger Ends Now. And we started it um, basically because we saw a need. We saw people coming into our emergency department who were trying to do nothing really but get food. They're having to choose between being able to pay their rent and get medicine or being able to get medicine or feed their families. And what we have power over is to be able to feed them. We know how to do that. So that's where we started. Um, we went to the town. They allowed us to use three and a half acres right in the middle of Monk's Corner in the town part. Um, we've also planted raised beds there. We have 88 and we've donated everything that we've grown so far. The Hen Project, um, it is a community garden. We do it to help people, to feed people, but really we want to spread the idea. So, because everybody can do it, it's not hard. We've been able to grow for, for the summer and this, this winter or fall crop right now, almost 2,000 pounds of produce that have been, and we're not done growing for this season, that have been donated. I think that hospital people just genuinely care about people. I don't think that that they would think that it's doing anything special. I mean, you're caring for somebody. You're trying to make sure that the person as a whole is cared for all the way up, whether they're children, whether they're seniors, whether they're in your hospital, whether they're outside of your hospital. And I think they're just, when you go into healthcare, you are just generally concerned about the well-being of people. I don't think it's anything special at all. I just think we happen to do it. The seven people represented in these six stories are amazing, yet they are not unique. They are members of a special breed of individuals, those who dedicate their lives to caring for others. They were selected as torchbearers, carrying the flame forward on behalf of the tens of thousands of people who work in our hospitals and drive South Carolina hospitals to go for the gold every day. I just think part of being a nurse is really, truly caring about your patient. What used to be a clear death sentence is not so anymore, and uh, there's a lot of hope in the work that's done in hospitals like this. Um, and I'm a good example of that. She puts her job first, and more importantly, she puts her patients first, because that is her job. This is not a job for me. This is a calling. Uh, if, if I got nothing in terms of financial gain for it, I'd still do it every day. I don't think I'm amazing, but uh, um, amazing things happen every day in my life um, here at the hospital with with people I see. And Open your eyes and look around you. And once you see somebody do something very small, it's something this small can make the biggest difference in somebody's life.